Today we have Rahim Rajan with us on Voices of Innovation. Welcome, Rahim. Thank you, Lev. It's a pleasure to be here. We're going to get right into it. Voices of Innovation invites big thinkers with bold ideas who are here at the ASU GSV Summit to talk about the influence of technology in today's society and our future of education. I'm your host, Lev Gonick from Arizona State University. Let's jump in. We know that uh, AQL Labs is, is the new venture we're going to get into, uh, the new work that you've done. Most of this audience is going to know you from your life and times at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, as you think about the moment that we're in, what in your mind is the value for innovators and for educators to be thinking that far in advance? Look, I think um, the biggest opportunity we have in front of us is educating, and I want to say the billions, not educating the millions, but educating the billions. There are billions of people across the globe that don't have good access to high quality learning experiences, upskilling experiences, professional development experiences. And I think as a learning community, as the innovators in the industry of education and learning, we have a profound responsibility to meet the moment and to educate the billions. And I think technology is gonna help us do that. And I'm not a I'm not a techno progressive, you know, um, you know, naive about. No, you're you're not a techno optimist. You're a techno pragmatist. I've always seen yes. that, that that's where you live. Absolutely, absolutely. So so when you think about that uh, that mission, the mission of engaging and educating the billions that's out there. Yeah. As you see the next ten to twenty years, take me down from. 39,000 feet, a little bit closer to yeah. kind of where do you see the practical application or where is the most important first set of moves and maybe tie that into kind of what AQL Labs is working on. Look, I think there's a lot of optimization that still needs to be happening. So I think about us being in maybe the third or fourth decade of the innovation cycle with education technology we are now entering this completely new paradigm with you know, intelligent machines, um, machine learning, advances in artificial intelligence. And I think what that unlocks for learners, but most importantly for institutions, right? I actually do believe, and you know, this, this makes me a bit of a counterculturalist in our system, in our sector. I actually believe in the power of institutions, the power of community for learning, um, and, you know, I think, you know, institutions of learning play many different roles. Some of those are cultural. Um, some of those are about knowledge generation, research. But I think it's, it's a huge opportunity for us to leverage these technologies to modernize and optimize the legacy institutions that exist. Um, and, so, and, and AQL's piece of that, are you the convener? Are you the yeah. technology? Are you both? Are you the yeah. market sensing? So yeah, so AQL Labs, what we've developed is both what we're calling an impact studio and what we're calling the foundry. And the foundry practice is actually focused on helping post-secondary institutions essentially like modernize and up-level their digital infrastructure. On a global basis. Yes. Right now we're focusing in the United States because right. we're lean and scrappy. Sure. And that's kind of where we, where we come from, both Amin Kazi and myself. But we have the global mind in view because the demand is actually global. It's not just in the United States. Right. Um, and in some ways, I think what we have learned in the United States is still the vanguard globally but we have a moral obligation to share those innovations globally. Um, at the same time, we're seeing new institutions arise all over the world. And some of those institutions are developing best practices that we could learn and leverage, right? So that's the foundry, really focused on institutions and modernizing and improving those institutions um, and leveraging these innovations, right. right? Like AI enablement. What does that mean? Right. 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 I, mean, I, th I think, you know, we can relate to that orientation, uh, you know, at ASU, given, you know, our track record over the last 22 years under Michael Crow's leadership yeah. that you know very, very well. Yeah. One of the things that we've experienced and we see it here at the ASU GSV Summit is that there are literally hundreds of schools, universities, for-profits, 
nonprofits, publics, um, NGOs yeah. who are here yeah. because they actually believe in the, dis the positive disruptive opportunity to leverage technology. And they've come to ASU yeah. over the years. And we actually have something called the University Design Institute, which is a variation on what you're talking about with AQL Labs, yes. which is to help institutions both engage in that journey and yes. optimize and disrupt in ways that are appropriate to you know their context. Absolutely. And the studio, the Venture Studio, yeah. the Impact Studio, I think the opportunity here, again, is to get back to our roots. What are the problems that institutions are facing? And how do we build design solutions and innovations with the customer in mind and with the users in mind? And to do that in a co-design, co-development approach, in a partnership approach. So we're not building for, we're building with. Uh, and again, I think that both you and I were deeply impressed by the insights. Here at this gathering, I just finished a breakfast meeting with colleagues from Vietnam and Malaysia. Yeah. And it's interesting kind of their sense, in many ways, trying to understand how a university like ASU got from where we began to where we are, rather than asking the question, how do we go from where we are to where we want to be? And in many ways, uh, here's, the, you know, here's the provocation for you. Maybe the market doesn't actually know exactly what it needs to co-develop, to co-design work because yeah. we don't yet have it. We, don't, we haven't unlocked our innovative design insights because we're largely looking to find a way to replicate what we think of as best practice. That's a bit of a provocation, but how do you I think th about so that? I, th I think about, I, I take the provocation seriously. I think we have to really understand what are the jobs to be done by these institutions right. and where are we not meeting the mark? Where are we encountering pain points, challenges, obstacles that hamper the progress and the journey of these learners, right? What, what are those barriers? How do we overcome those barriers? Which of those barriers are the default setting, so to speak? And where do we actually need to redesign the experience to remove those barriers? How do we, how do we get around the corner? How do we get around like not designing for the next 24 months, but yeah. more like for the next 24 years? Or is that actually something we can't really do because the best we can do is design build, which is to say, design as best we can for 24 months and build it and then iterate and iterate. How do you think about the design challenge? I think I think we we know there are certain things that hamper our progress and our ability to execute and deliver value for students and I think we need moonshots like I absolutely believe that there are things that we can do that are table stakes to improve the current experience or the marginal future experience but I absolutely believe higher education needs to entertain the conversation of you know where is this going a decade from now and, and again, even if that's really hard for us to fully predict, what are some experimental things that we're going to launch to truly validate or iterate or build that future? And so right? how, how do you personally and how do, do you and your co-founder think about the ways in which AQL Labs can help folks both, again, in the foundry and in the studio, maybe yeah. using the studio yeah. as the vehicle? to help folks imagine the future. It's one of the things that I found most compelling about the gathering of the 100 Year EdTech Project were these 12 scenarios, yeah. which were definitely futurescaping. In, in fact, in some ways it was so interesting because it took a couple of hours for folks to get their heads wrapped around, you know, how do we think about you know, education systems in which we, you know, we're beginning to assume rather than to have to, you know, to, have to live with you know, the uh, you know, the integration of the biological with the technical, right? Yeah. So I think one of the opportunities here, again, in the studio, I think we're very focused on what are some of those unmet needs. Mm -hmm. So it's not just like innovation for innovation's sake. Not. It has to be grounded in real problems, real challenges. What are current, like real fundamental um, unmet needs? You know, honestly, like we're focusing on institutions that are living under scarcity, yeah. you know, that, you know, we're entering a climate of probably um, even more scarcity, right? Mm -hmm. So it's going to require institutions to collaborate in new ways, but it's also going to require institutions to be uncomfortable 
and to be much more agile. Mm -hmm. And when you think about the experience of an ASU over the past two decades, I think you and I can agree not everything worked. Oh, of course not. Right? But that was never the point. That, uh, and the design was to design, build, and if we were going to hit a speed bump, to be able to, as you said, agilely pivot. Absolutely. And I think more and more institutions, and particularly many institutions that are under-resourced, that are, in a sense, much more fragile, mm -hmm. they have to be willing to take those risks. And, I, and I, one more thing I would say is, like, as we dream about that future, both in some of the dystopian scenarios, but even I, I want to say, like, I'm, a, I'm actually an optimist at heart. You, yeah. you know, I, I wouldn't be doing this work if I didn't believe in, in actually the moral value of what, what we have the charge in front of us. Like, we need a wide variety of institutions to invent that future and to be at the table. Yeah, right? I do think the insight that you offered around scarcity is worth us spending another minute on because yeah. I think that is one of the fundamental differentiators. You know, I... I've been in this space a very long time, and I don't think all institutions, certainly not institutional leaders, have fully internalized the difference between an abundance mindset yes. and the scarcity mindset. What can we do to help unlock additional value to encourage leaders to take on the design work that's associated with abundance rather than managing for scarcity, which is yeah. the default. I mean, I just spent a week in Australia last week. Yeah. And that was the conversation. The, the, the chancellors and vice chancellors that I met with were looking for insights. And for me, it came down to ASU's not only engaging in abundance mindset as a kind of foundational commitment, but how that is actually then generating our opportunities to be innovative and not all, as you said, not always winning on the first round, but being able to quickly iterate. So how do we unlock in your mind sort of the abundance mindset? So I, I would argue, and this is one of our goals with AQL Labs, is to rethink the value creation. So institutions historically have been kind of the, you know, the, the romper room or the gymnasium where many of our technologies have been iterated, been developed, been designed, been improved. Right. And yet the equity and the value proposition to institutions has been unequal. Right. So how do we shift that? Right. How do we align the incentives so that institutions are actually investing in some of these companies that are experimenting on their behalf and, and activating some of these innovators to, to work in a sandbox with many institutions. Do you want so to, it, it, it requires challenging some of the ways institutions have historically worked together, but also creating new value proposition on the investment side, on the value creation side that keeps institutions at the center. I think you've tried uh, in your career, certainly in our interactions over the years when you were at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to do just that. Yes. Do you want to reflect on some of the scenarios, maybe one scenario where you think actually you advance the ball and maybe some general reflections on why that's so difficult? Because I don't think we are, as an industry, yeah. very good at it. Yeah. Even with the convening power of the Gates Foundation, yeah. even with the investment power, I think that it's interesting for me to reflect as essentially a co-designer of, of a number of those activities. Yeah, uh, It's more difficult than we probably would have hoped and certainly experienced. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, two examples that are pretty obvious come to mind. I think both in terms of thinking about the technologies and innovations around advising and student supports, but also the technologies around, you know, adaptive learning, personalized learning. You know, today we talk a lot about tutors. Five or 10 years ago, we were talking about adaptive platforms, courseware solutions. In both of those, you know, distinct areas, I think the Gates Foundation played a very profound role in both creating a space for institutions to test, to iterate, to innovate, but also to measure, to understand what's working for learners, what's working for advisors, and most importantly, doing that with private actors, with the market, yeah, think, separate from the market. I think that you're exactly, exactly right. Another thing that I know you did at Gates, and I know you, that you personally have a deep commitment to and I invite you to just say a couple of words about it, is the commitment also to equity. Yes. I mean, how do you pull off both 
the uh, the ability to unlock the abundance mindset to actually again convene and get folks uh, yeah. to, to be working together and at the same time try to make sure that it's not an afterthought to yeah. attend to the equity piece so i think you know i i'm i'm very sad about the moment we're in because i've seen the weaponization of the word equity at the very heart of that word is unlocking opportunity for everyone, mm -hmm. right? It, it means that we are creating systems of learning, systems of education right. that literally advantage everyone. And that is not the current system that we have. And I think we have to understand that it is a net positive for society, for our economies, for our competitiveness globally, you know, for our quality of living, for our quality of standard of living, if we are able to move everybody forward. Right. And so to me, you know, that is the the root of that. And I think that when I think about innovations, when I think about institutions, you know, both from a mission perspective of how do they improve, how do they serve the wide variety of students that they're seeking to serve? And, you know, that diversity is only increasing. Right. Um, but even if you're building solutions, right, especially now with technology, with AI, you know, we have certain concerns about the data that's training these models. Like, how do we make sure we have representative data sets? How do we, you know, make sure these models are, are responsible in a sense? I think we have an ethical, moral responsibility to build learning technologies that are going to serve a much broader, diverse population. Right, and I the, think that's the, also good for the market. Like, right. It's good for business, you know? Like, it's not antith antithetical to market outcomes. No, on the contrary, in many ways, if you don't understand the segmentation of the market, you're missing the market. Absolutely. Yeah. So you've been coming to this event, you know, in fact, thanks to you and to your colleagues at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation when you were with them, you know, you, you've been major uh, investors in this gathering. As we look forward 12 months and as we get together next year in San Diego, what is an example of one development, either through the AQL Labs yeah. experience or otherwise that you're going to say, you know what, this is how we mark our progress along the journey? Yeah. So it's really about helping real institutions make real progress on meaningful things they are trying to accomplish with their digital infrastructure, you know, with executing an AI strategy, you know, how do they source the most innovative innovations or figure out where the gaps are and how do we start to construct or co-design some of those solutions. So, you know, I'm holding myself accountable. I want to come back in a year and I want to be able to say, okay, we literally helped this institution or this network of institutions achieve X outcome. Well, wishing you and your colleagues good luck at that. And we'll absolutely check in next year. In fact, we won't have to wait to next year because we're looking forward to working together with you. Awesome. Thanks for your time today, Rahim Rajan. Thank you. Thanks for being with us Thank on you, Voices of Innovation. Thanks for your leadership. Absolutely.